great to see such a full house tonight. I wanted to welcome you to this evening's um, inspiring entrepreneurs event with Mary Portis. My name is Anna Schultz and I'm the founder and CEO of the Anna Schultz plus size designer label. Um, and I'm a big fan of the Business and IP Centre in the British Library, which helps lots of young businesses and established business with a lot of great networking events, resources, and um, has got a fantastic innovation for growth programme. So to tell you a little bit about myself, my business idea kind of started when I was 13 years old and a frustrated shopper in Germany when I was six foot tall and a size 16, I couldn't find anything to wear. So I started making my own clothes. I became a plus size model. I came to England in 1990 to study fashion design at St. Martin's College. And I started my own business in 1996, which is a hell of a long time ago now. So over the years, we had a fantastic time selling to great stores like Harrods, Selfridges, Bloomingdale's and Saks Fifth Avenue in the States. I dressed many, many inspiring women, which I really enjoyed. My whole mission in life has always been to bring more inclusivity into the fashion business and to make women of all sizes feel included and enjoy shopping again. So there comes a point in business where you always, it's very healthy for you to step back and take a look at it again, because uh, the business landscape around you keeps changing all the time, especially with the rise of e-commerce and all the social media and the influencers which are active today. It's really healthy to take a step back from time to time and relook at your business. So yeah, last year, I did join the Libraries Innovation for Growth program, and it was incredibly useful. So if you are an established business or a young startup business, I would highly recommend for anybody to use the fantastic resources and database of the British Library. I don't know if any of you are entrepreneurs or if you want to look at the website and research what the library actually has to offer for you. It's really worth checking out. So um, <clears throat> since launching the whole program of the Business and IP Centre in 2006, the centre has welcomed over 750,000 women. And, oh, no, sorry, 750,000 people, but 62% of those are women. Sorry, I'm always really nervous when I have to do public speaking. It's terrible. <laughs> um, and 42% of those are from black, Asian, and minority ethnic backgrounds. So there's a really diverse audience out there. Today's event with Mary Porters is particularly close to my heart because I met Mary, first of all, 10 years ago when I appeared on Mary Queen of Shops. And it was such a great break for, for us as a business. It really pushed us forward. Um, it made our website crash, but again, it was another learning curve. You always have to be prepared for the good things to happen as well. So I would like to say that there is another little video you should watch, and you can learn what the uh, business center has in store for you and what you can learn from it. And then I'm sure Mary Portis and Sally Hughes will kick off a fantastic, inspiring evening. Thank you. Starting a business on your own can be quite challenging because all of the decisions lie with you. You become so focused on your work and sometimes the balance just slightly rocks in the wrong direction. As entrepreneurs, a lot of people come from similar backgrounds and a lot of people have similar concerns when they start their business. I didn't have any experience and I really hardly had any money to start it up. So I was just thinking out of the box and seeing what was out there. The Business and IP Centre in London is really the start of a national rollout of Business and IP Centres throughout England. What we're doing is we're empowering people by giving them the knowledge that they need to make the right decision. We've got one of the largest business and information collections in the entire UK with experienced staff on hand to help our customers use these resources. The centre actually proves that the library is not only for academics but also for business people and provides very high quality resources to help entrepreneurs. We've got keynote reports, Mintel reports, which will enable them to do market research. 
We offer workshops, we offer one-to-one -one advice sessions. One that we attended and that was really useful was the one with the IP lawyer. We went there and learned how to protect our images and, uh, and uh, footage. People have come back and offered to speak at some of our events because they want to share the experience that they've had in the centre with other people. The most useful programme for me was the Innovating for Growth programme which is designed to support owners of small businesses develop and grow their businesses and step outside of them and really look at them from a commercial and strategic perspective. It's always a fantastic experience to meet other entrepreneurs, share information, share doubt and success. It is the most phenomenal programme and it's helped me strip down my business which is what I really wanted to do. If you're not sure where to begin or just need someone to talk to about your idea, the BIPC is a great place to start. Hi. Hello everyone and welcome to this lovely event at the British Library. Never done an event here before, it's so gorgeous. So welcome all. Um, I have a few things that I need to impart before I welcome Mary onto the stage, but we'll whiz through this bit as fast as we can. Um, welcome to you all, but also welcome to all our online viewers watching via a webcast and Periscope and to the libraries in Bangor, Cambridge, Exeter, Glasgow, Hull, Ipswich, Leeds, Manchester, Middlesbrough, Northampton, Norwich, Nottingham, Poole, Sheffield and Worcester, <laughs> who are hosting their own screenings as part of the Business and IP Centre National Network. Feedback forms will be placed on the seat in the auditorium. Please do fill them in as they're extremely important to help us maintain our service. Please do feel also very welcome to leave your comments, thoughts, questions and responses throughout the evening on Twitter or any other social media platform. We'd be very grateful if at BIPC could be included in any tweets sent about this event. And likewise, if you attended our Work Like a Woman Day of business development talks today by other inspiring women, do mention that too. The hashtag for this entire event is BLMaryPortis. There will also be an opportunity for questions after our conversation today, so please save yours until then. And there will be a book signing in the foyer between 8.30 and 9. So before I introduce Mary properly, let's have her on the stage. Please welcome Mary Portis. I bought my book just in case I forgot what I wrote. Sorry, I'm going to make you read a bit in a bit. Oh, good. So just like me, Mary Portis began her retail career with a Saturday job in Boots. Did you? Yes. Oh, goody. Unlike me, she then went on to roles at John Lewis, Harrods and Topshop before becoming a board member of Harvey Nichols while still in her 20s. Mary created the famous Harvey Nichols window displays and is credited with turning the store into, inter into an internationally renowned brand. In 1997, she left to found the agency Yellow Door, producing campaigns for clients like Mercedes, Louis Vuitton, Swarovski and Patek Philippe. In 2013, she relaunched the agency as Portus. Mary is widely regarded as the country's leading authority on retail and brand communication. She is in great demand at business events and has spoken alongside figures including Neil Armstrong and the Dalai Lama exalted company, I'm sure they would agree. <laughs> Mary's television career has taken her from a guest appearance on Richard and Judy in 2005 <laughs> to series including Mary Queen of Shops, Mary Queen of Frocks, Mary Porter's Secret Shopper, Mary Queen of the High Street and What Britain Buys. In the wake of Mary Queen of Charity Shops, Mary launched the first of several living and giving shops and was subsequently commissioned by the government to lead an independent review of Britain's struggling high streets. In December 2011, she delivered her report to our last Prime Minister. And yes, I do have to keep checking my phone to make sure he is still our last Prime Minister, <laughs> not our last but one. <laughs> Mary's work with the government has been a catalyst for the regeneration of our communities and retail spaces. 
Mary's also found the time to write a number of books, the newest of which is Work Like a Woman, a manifesto for change which calls time on alpha culture and argues that success comes through embracing crucial values, not outdated and patriarchal business rules. Please welcome Mary Porter. Yeah. Mm. So I'm going to go in heavy. Oh, God. The Time's Up movement has given so many women a voice. Did it spark the flame of this book, or were you unaware when you began? What was brilliant? Um, well, it just was all about when I started writing it. Um, and I'm one of these people that if I feel that I'm, I'm sort of slightly behind the curve, I get quite panicked. And I was like, oh, no, someone else is going to click yeah. and realise that, that really there's a huge movement that's needed about women and their place in work. So... The Time's Up, the, the Me Too, the gender pay gap was just this backdrop that kept on rolling and getting faster and kept getting bigger. And at the time, I was writing the book, which took about 18 months, but I had already restructured my agency around these female values, which I thought were going to be really, really vital to the future of how women work. There were a couple of books that came out where women were talking about how to reach the top, um, one of them being Sheryl Sandberg's Lean In, and I remember reading it and thinking, but I don't want to bloody lean in. I don't want to lean into a system that, quite frankly, doesn't fit well with me. And I'd realised that what I had done many of the time had lent in, had lent into an alpha culture in order to succeed. And that really, in order for me to empower women and men and the millennials, the next generation of people who just quite simply don't want to work in this outdated, linear, fairly aggressive mode. I had to start making change within my own business. We're going to come back to the specific and practical changes you've made into your business later. But I think it, the difficulty for lots of particularly young women um, or women who perhaps work in certain industries where they get off a little more lightly than in others is that we think that things have improved. Um, the number of women on the board has doubled in the past 10 years. Um, there are constant urges throughout this book that we mustn't become complacent and think things are fixed. Have we become? I think, and I don't think we've become complacent, but I do think that um, there is this fear, even when I was writing it, you know, should I call it work like a woman? And one of, I, even, even the discussion I was having with my incredible team at... Um, Transworld and one sitting in the front who kept on pushing me, um, Vicky, uh, when we were saying, don't man up. And I, on, on LinkedIn, someone wrote, you're a knob porter, so I'm blocking you. <laughs> and it's always like, great when they let you know, like Moses yeah. on the mountain, isn't yeah. it? No, I'm I following you. <laughs> I'm not following you. Yeah. And when That's I've it. had a few drinks, I'm like, oh, and then you have to go stop it. And Melanie normally goes, don't respond, don't respond, take a breath, put oxygen in it. And I thought, am I alienating men? And then you realise you have to just go with this. You have to push this to the extreme in order that we come back to a place that feels comfortable. And quite frankly, we are nowhere near a place that feels comfortable or right for women. Yes, it's improved, but it's shockingly pants when you start to look at the stats. And I went through my career thinking, oh, I've got into a position of power because I'm good. Um, and, you know, I, I am pretty good, Sally. But, um, and I believe I, you. <laughs> and I worked really hard, but I also worked into a construct that I adapted myself in. And lots of women who have got to the top have also done that. Sheryl Sandberg included. Has certainly done that. Has certainly done that. So I think we've come, we are better. When I look at my, my parents' generation, we've improved. But when we look at the fact that women make up 50% of the workforce, that young women coming out of university are getting better grades than most young men. They're going into those jobs, the starter jobs, and then if they go like this, and then it just goes like that. There's a chilling moment in the book where you have this moment of realisation that your own daughter will be retiring just at the moment where we anticipate the gender pay gap may be closing, which is 2078. Yeah. Sorry, Verity, I know I was <laughs> Where is she? Just put your hand up. There she is behind me. 
Where is she? Right up the back. Anyway, yes. And I, I hello, darling. Thank you for coming to listen to me <laughs> going on, which Sorry we have to, to listen to at home. Yeah. Um, and it, but it's 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 quite frightening. So you just she just left university. The world, according to the World Economic Forum, that my 22-year-old daughter will have retired by the time there is gender pay parity. That is totally and utterly unacceptable. And when I was writing it, I had to, rem you know, I would sometimes get a bit fearful that I was pushing this too much. And then the stats would come in. I had incredible researchers. And it actually made me just sad and angry at the same time, which those two emotions are just powerful. And I'm sad and I'm angry and we need voices and we need to change this and we need women to start changing it. And we need the fabulous men who are sitting in the audience who are obviously the types of men who also want to make this change to come together and, and shift what is a blockage in women getting to the top. You touched just now on, on what you had done previously. In, in the book, you talk lots about classic female qualities, and they're just classic female qualities. You don't exclude anyone from them, but the qualities we associate with women, like empathy, vulnerability, intuition, resilience. Mm. I'm going to talk to you more about those qualities specifically, but first, can we just talk about what you mean when you say you're encouraged to repress those qualities to fit into the alpha mode? How have you fallen into that trap in your career? Oh. I remember so vividly a major brand that I work for and one of, one of the guys got sacked and he was like, you know, a father of three kids and he came out completely, you know, thrown. And the, 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 the boss of this business, who I knew very well, said, don't take it personally. And you're like, what the fuck? <laughs> I've just been fired. Mm. Don't take it personally. You're not allowed to show your emotion. You know, exactly the same with don't man up. That means, you know, man up means don't show emotion. Yeah. Emotion means vulnerability. Emotion means weakness. It doesn't. And the more that we're able to put that into business and accept that work is emotional, we are emotional human beings, work identifies us as well as much as our personal life, if not more. Therefore, emotion needs to be in it. So I would, no way would I show my emotion when I was on the board. I would just, you know, close it down, suppress it, and not let people know that I felt hurt about that. That was wrong. That wasn't the way to behave. You just had to go along with those codes. And even when I was doing politics, and I was dealing with politicians, which, let me tell you, is not easy, because the premise of them as well, so many of them who do go in wanting to make change happen, I think I don't think most politicians are bastards. Yeah. They kind of end up being. Yeah. Because the system is toxic and it pushes them out the other end. In order to succeed within that toxic system, you have to play the games. Now, how much better would it have been if Theresa May had said, you know what, we got this wrong. Yeah. We got this wrong. I feel really vulnerable going and taking on this major thing that we have to do over Brexit. I think it's wrong. She might have got fired, but my God, she'd have done what was the truth. And so often we don't. And showing vulnerability and saying, I can't do that or I'm scared, opens up this huge honesty space where people then can act, interact with you on a truthful basis. And I remember doing talking about the high street and politician after politician I met, and they, they'd ask me who I'd done my due diligence with. What, you know, what businesses had I talked to, what great leaders across the country. And I'd travelled the country for about two years, looking at each high street, meeting with landlords, meeting with shopkeepers, retailers, the publics, councils. And they said to me, but have you met with Sir Philip Green? <laughs> and you'd go, I have met him, yeah. And that then was power and money. And I remember having this discussion because they hadn't shifted stuff. And I got so upset. And one of them said to me, you're too emotional for politics. And I thought, actually, no. That's what politics needs, is real emotion. And so much of the stuff that we have to suppress in business to get to the top actually stops us being human. And really, this could be called Mary Porter's work like a human really 
let's just be more humane because this is relevant to men as well. Well, politics especially is talking about issues that are hugely emotive to all people. Yeah. We all become emotional about the health of our families, the education yes. of our families, our national identity. Those are emotional things. So to make those chilly and removed and cut off, it, it, it seems the oddest thing of all. You, you talk about this pretense, you've just mentioned it here, this sort of pretending you don't care about something, pretending you're upset about something. One of the things that you talk about during your time at Harvey Nichols, which I think broadly was a, was a happy and certainly a very oh, successful yeah. time, but you do say uh, often that you pretended that your family wasn't more important than work, which obviously it was. Is yeah. that something... I think that still happens to women. Oh, of course it does. I mean, I think, and I think the biggest problem is even more so with men and having paternity leave. You know, it's not seen as being driven. If you look at the sort of business model, most business models, and certainly in lots of the corporate world, it's kind of like a racehorse where you put the blinkers on, you go, there's the goal, you're racing to that end line. And invariably, the end line in business is profit. Look, mm -hmm. look at The Apprentice, for Christ's sake. Must I? Do you do it anymore, do you? <laughs> My kids like it. Sometimes. Yeah, exactly. Just so to see I. the awful yeah. wankers on it. Yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So you go, I wouldn't employ any of you lot. You're all a bunch of knobs. And it's not about who is the most you know, creative, who's got the leadership skills. It's about who will make the most and get that most money at the end. Whether, I mean, look, it gave us Katie Hopkins, for Christ's sake, what can you say? That sort of aggressive, linear way to approach work. Well, I can't even remember the question because I've gone off. Well, no, no, it's interesting because you're bringing me on to my next one. What do you mean by circular ambition? So you're talking about linear ambition. Uh, you're talking about family. So, yeah. so uh, circular ambition it, or life ambition is about being happy and fulfilled. That, that should be, I think, generally, the most ambitious that we want. So to cut off those aspects of life that are so important to your friends, family, your parents, and, and just be driven on this, this business road and not expect your teams of people to be influenced by all the other parts of their life is absolutely crazy. So. Most people, it, it, for example, paternity leave, some of the best paternity leave in this country is with the big banks. They give guys six months off paternity leave. It's fantastic. Most don't take it. Most don't take it because the culture is be in at this hour, work all the hours that God sends. This is what we need to make. So most men saying, bye, I'm clearing off for six months to look after the baby within that culture, feel embarrassed to take it. When I was at Harvey Nicks and I had, I had children, I'd be sitting in the board meeting that would be going on to seven o'clock in the evening. And you'd think, oh my God, three hours, someone could have had a heart bypass and we're still looking at numbers and discussing this. And I would nip out to ring the nanny and say, can you make sure that Milo has got his stuff for school tomorrow, or whatever. Why was I unable to say, this is really running over. I know it's important, but you can catch me on the phone. I need to get back for my kids. I was embarrassed. And I think most people still to this day... More socially acceptable, professionally acceptable yeah. to say, I need a wee. Well, yeah, then it was to exactly, say, I need, to check I need on my a kids. wee, yeah. and then just yeah. ring because this was before mobiles. Um, so we need to shift that because most people want to do their best at work. Most people actually want to feel that they're free to discuss their family, free to discuss the other issues that might be ha in their life. Because when you are able to do that and you are fully bringing yourself to work, then of course you bring the best out in people and people give the best to business. Quite. Millennials are rejecting this linear career trajectory, which we've talked about, they're rejecting it. And the streams are crossing in that what millennials are now demanding is what women have secretly, embarrassedly wanted all along. Um, but is this way of work failing men? So I'm a mother of two sons. Um, I'm married to a man and none of them um, can relate in any way either to this culture that you have rejected, this sort of alpha male culture. They're not those types of blokes. 
you know. And is it failing men? You've already highlighted that men are spending less time with their new baby than they would probably like. But is it failing them in other ways? Please? Yeah, I mean, listen, you, we, you are probably with lots, you know, your young sons and your, your, your husband is, you know, we're not talking about the average people. Sure. And, and I think... We live in Brighton, so... She lives in Brighton. <laughs> this is very creative. Yeah. Is my jacket rattling? Yeah. Oh, I didn't realise. Thank you. That's nice. A note from the front, your jacket's rattling. Thanks. <laughs> Um, so, you know what, the, the thing is, Sally, we can, we can take out stats and say, oh, I know this, these people are really good and I know these guys and they're great and my, my children are like that. That's, that's true, but we are talking about, when we look at the system today, we are talking about the businesses where, quite frankly, for example, take my business, the retail business, 80% of all buying decisions are made by women. 80%, even, you know, choosing their men's pants and what car, it's bought by women. Yeah. When you look at the retail organisations, the fashion industry particularly, between 60 and 80% of women are within that industry. 10% are on boards. So either we're rubbish and we can't quite make it up to a certain level, or we don't want to, or something is wrong with the system. So you've got an evolved guy who you're married to, you've got evolved young men, children, who maybe don't see this as an issue. I remember once talking with my son, Milo, about being a feminist. He goes, why do you need to, Mama? Look what, you know, look what you've achieved. And you go, because we have to do this. We have to do this for the other women. And we have to do it for the future of young men like you. Now, interestingly, when it comes to millennials, there, there is no security. They're saying, why do I need to work yeah. like that? Because I'm not sure I'm going to get the house. I'm not sure that I'm going to be able to have the life that you've got. I mean, I grew up in a generation where you thought you had to do better than your parents. That's just not going to happen. So they're looking at their lives and thinking, how do I feed all of me and, and, and my soul and my creativity and my whole life rather than just going on this one track, which quite frankly, isn't really going to get me anywhere. But also now looking at Generation Z, who are different to the millennials, those kids are coming in and going, they're, they're lacking the freedom. They're saying kids are doing less drugs and drinking less and because they've seen their parents all like rocking it and thinking, God, I so don't want to be like that. <laughs> so you've got all this other new, which are going to be quite a serious little generation coming yeah. in. And it's not that they don't want to work. They do. But this security, this infrastructure, this security that we all need in our lives isn't there. And so if we look differently at the workplace and we become, we become more flexible, and I mean that in generosity of spirit and respectful, then surely we are going to bring in a groups of different groups of people, different perspectives, and just make it so much better for everybody. Yes, hard to give up your entire life to a company when you know full well you're working in a climate where you're never going to get the carriage clock and the pension at the end of it. Exactly. And so it's, you're, it's you're getting very little in return, and so you need something for your life. Can I talk to you about identity? Because it comes up yeah. loads in the book. Um, this is at the root of the problem, according to the book. The notion that women are having to be other people in order to succeed, as we define the word of success, instead of embracing who we really are. Can you talk more about your journey in, the area, in that area, where you went with your identity instead of against it, I suppose? Well, I think if, you're, if you are totally free with your identity um, and feel confident in who you truly are, that frees you up to be honest and open and the truth is the most empowering thing so if we look at you know any groups whether that is you know women having to perform in a different way in order to succeed in business it's quite exhausting and i think one of my most freeing you know things around identity was when i fell in love with a woman and had to say you know that identity that you've all thought and interacted with me on? Well, there's a different one here now. And even when I went into the public eye on TV and um, the lovely news of the world found out about it, <laughs> and we woke up on a Sunday morning to my poor producer going, please don't be upset, but there's a double-page spread in the news of the world that said, Mary, Queen of Shocks. 
the fact that um, there was the, the title shocks associated yes. with me yeah. said something quite terribly negative. So Mary, the shock is, oh, she's living with a woman. Yeah. So you have to deal with that. And the, the, your instinct, my instinct was, oh, you know, what's that going to do to my career? And we're talking 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there's been a massive shift in identity. And the way that it's only been able to shift is by us saying yes to gay marriage. Yes to accepting this. And we're talking about ethnic minorities, all those suppressed groups, the only way we've ever, anyone's ever been able to break through and say, we're not the norm, and who wants to be the bloody norm anyway? But the only way that we can push those barriers is by going out and saying, this is me. And the more that businesses can accept that, the more that they are going to bring in people who will bring their true selves to work. And if we keep business without opening up to truth and identity, we end up with boards of like-minded people who invariably, and still today, are white, middle-aged, middle-class men. That is the truth. So that has to change. And it won't be just about quotas, or let's put two women on the board, because the culture will still be the sure. same. It has to come from up. And it has to come from young people starting out in the workplace and saying, this is me, this is me. And uh, I had to wait many years to feel free to be who I was within business and all of my life. And I don't think, and I wouldn't want anybody to do that who in any way works with me. One thing that you did trust, or certainly came to trust very strongly, and it comes up a lot, is you place a huge important on it, importance on intuition. Yeah. Um, you say in the book, intuition is not a female thing, it's a human thing. Yeah. Uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates agreed. They both uh, very strongly believed in intuition. What does intuition mean to you and why is it so important in business, do you think? Well, I think, you know, intuition is the complete antithesis of data. Uh, and we, we do need data. But I have seen so many businesses squashed where they've been successful by a vision, an intuitive connection to the world. Intuition comes from being connected to the, and I don't want to sound like Oprah here, but I will. She talks about her inner frequency. <laughs> Sounds nice, doesn't it? Yeah. But connecting your true self to the world actually creates this this symbiotic sort of intuition. Intuition can't be done just on your own. Intuition only opens up when you open up. And great, great leaders and great innovators and great business people often work a lot on intuition. Intuition in corporate businesses often gets suppressed because the data starts and the finances start leading businesses. So often I've seen so many businesses, and I speak to any business people out there, the worst mistakes I've ever made is when I've ignored my intuition. But so often, businesses are built on this with understanding this kind of idea. I've got this idea and I know it's going to work and I, you feel connected to the sort of cultural zeitgeist and you build these great businesses and then they get successful and they get bought, bought out, normally by investment people, and then they start doing the numbers and they start closing it in because that starts dictating how the business should be run and you lose the essence of it. And my favorite quote is Gloria Steinem's where she just says, if it looks like a duck and it waddles like a duck and it quacks like a duck, but you think it's a pig, it's a pig. <laughs> and it's so true. And the, uh, the biggest mistakes I've made is when I've just gone against that and looked at logic and reasoning and gone against my interest. When have you gone against it? Oh, God, many times where I've gone for pieces of business and I felt the energy isn't right or I don't like the client and I've looked at and people have gone, my God, it's really good money. And I've gone, yeah, it is, because I like a bit of money of as well. And then I've kind of gone against that or I've gone against it just in simple things where you just feel 
I, I mean, many times in business, I would think, or even people, where I've met people and I think it looks logically right, they look well, and there's something in me that hasn't quite connected, and I've gone back over and looked at all their qualifications, blah, 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 and about my intuition's kind of going, no, but, oh, that looks really good, and I've employed people where it hasn't worked. You've talked yourself into it, because yeah, on course. paper it sounds Of course, right. yeah. of course, of course. You talk about one of my favourite passages in the book because it's so rare that you would hear this perspective, but I think many of us share it. You talk about the tyranny of the perfect businesswoman in business profiles <laughs> and career pages. Um, so, so the lady who gets up at four for uh, tennis coaching and a, and, a, and a blow dry and some light yoga or whatever. Um, if that's the case, what kind of female ro role models do we need in business? Well, I think the fashion industry and the, the, you know, our industry has a lot to answer for and what we put on front covers. You know, if I see Amal Clooney in another interview, I'll shoot myself. Yes, she's married to George. Fantastic. She looks fantastic. And, you know, come on. Those role models that put up for young women are just a bloody joke. I did a school yesterday and you were there with me, Sally, and those questions came up time and time again about their identity, how they look. You know, that's the currency that's being put out. The currency is you're successful, you're beautiful, yeah, you're, you're doing your Mandarin, you've had eight kids, you know, you're flying here and you're back in time for supper. And, like, give me a bloody break. <laughs> Also, that, that sounds horrible. It's that a, sounds oh like, God. I don't want that life. I that so sounds so don't grim. Want that. And yeah. you know, interestingly though, I get interviewed as, for a lot for Glossy Men. They say, what's Christmas going to be like? You're sticking the <laughs> yeah. tree. And I go, no, it's bloody knackering. You don't yeah. want to write that. Really Christmas stressful. is knackering. We're trying to work out who's going to get the tree, who's going to order this. And you get to the day. And I remember one Christmas, Mel and I were like, it got to the day and we sat down to eat and all our family looking glamorous. And we were still in our sort of pyjamas because <laughs> we'd cooked and we managed to be like, Jesus, we haven't even put any makeup on. So let's stop breaking all this stuff. You know, let's start talking honestly. And I want to look at these women who have achieved that have done so much that uh, aren't on the glossy pages we need to be putting them into the business pages we need to be putting them into the media we need to be talking about them and you know great people like jude kelly is doing the women mm -hmm. of the world conference mm -hmm. where she travels and you go to those and you just meet these incredible women who don't give a shit about these kind of shoes I do, and I don't mind that. I like looking yeah. good, but I don't look like this all the time, let me tell you. Yeah. And we need to be honest about that. And when you, you know, when you get the papers papping you, when I'm doing a funny face with my son walking the dog and you know, I've got no makeup on, they love showing it in the mail. Um, <laughs> you know, you, I could stop and just put on a ton of makeup and not do that, but I think, no, sod it. It's your problem if you're going to show me I like that. I always feel like the, the biggest favour high-profile women could ever do for other women is to admit that they have paid childcare, go on diets and have Botox. Absolutely. I think, I think if they said those three things, everybody else could make a choice. They could go, <laughs> either I want that, I want to engage in those things, and then I might be a bit like that, or actually I can't be asked and I'm happy being me. But it's the denial that those systems are in place, I think, that causes I, problems. And, and I agree, and I think that honesty is refreshing <laughs> and it's wonderful. I had a, I had, um, a, a fabulous woman driver who's been driving me around London, and, I had, and she just said... Oh, I said, you look great. And she went, it's the fillers, darling. It's the fillers. Yeah. <laughs> and I just thought that was so fabulous that she talked about that. Yeah, and didn't Davina care. McCall and Olivia Coleman, or whoever just saying, I get Botox, mm. is such a joy, isn't it? Or somebody saying, oh, I couldn't live without my nanny, which well, is totally Anne Marie Duff true. said recently. Yeah, yeah it's, it's amazing. You talk about childcare a lot in your book, which I respect because so many i've interviewed so many uh famous women who tell me at interview they have no childcare while there are literally nannies running around behind our conversation well i've got my manny That's hello say hello to Yvonne. <laughs> it's you go on i've got a manny put your hand up there he is and he's listening to me <laughs> and it, you know it can go the other way because when we were choosing and mel said to me oh I, I you know i want a guy to look after ratio you know he's got two lesbians <laughs> and i said well i can play football i can get out there and play the football my brother comes around and takes in the football she said, no, I want a guy. and it was interesting so many people won't choose a guy because of the prejudice there and i had think, a manny and people said oh, don't you worry yeah yeah and i think yeah. the prejudice can go the way and we talked about that and i said you know so many people feel the first thing they think is, oh, God, something dodgy is going to go up. Yeah. And you think this is just deeply unfair. So it works the other way as well. Yeah. So what responsibilities 
um, do senior career women have to those who come after them in that case? Okay, there's the going out with the dog looking a bit rough. That's definitely helpful. But what, <laughs> what, what responsibilities do you have in the workplace for women coming after you? Well, I think how I work in, in the workplace is I sit out with my team. I don't have any hierarchy in an office where I feel this aloofness. So often, and we have a desk sharing so you can turn up at any desk. So all of them will know what's going on in my lives and, you know, what I have to sort out. They'll see that I'm, you know, you have to be real. They'll see that I'm trying to balance stuff. They'll, I, you know, many a time I've had a tear in the office, you know, or I felt frustrated over something. They see when these things, or we've had client meetings where I've just thought, what the hell? How do we navigate this? They're there with you. I think that is the most important part that you're not aloof you're not behaving as if life isn't affecting you or clients or business isn't affecting you. you're there with them we have what we call a hierarchical competence we don't have power so we have everybody's there who's in positions of competence or seniority to train to guide to motivate and inspire the next generation we have an open thing where we think we don't always get this right so my md has what she calls md for a day where she will have the most junior people who have just come out of university or people that work for two three years or five years with the saying this is what we would do if we were in your shoes. So that gives them this confidence and uh, that they're being heard. Well, and no doubt you're learning things back that you hadn't thought of. Totally and utterly. And the other thing is, is one of the really important things that we do is we, when we have reviews and appraisals, we don't call them sort of, you know, um, your... your um, is it appraisal? What's the word where you sit down on a one-to-one? -one? The old-fashioned word. Review. Word review or job no isn't it when you're going for your is it appraisal yeah appraisal maybe it is it's I'm, grim i'm tired the classic it's, appraisal is grim it's grim and it's also about a one-to-one -one and it's appraising you and you think well that just sounds like i'm just being judged so we break that and what you do is you have you know chats where you're being inspired and motivated and you talk about issues that you're having and and they will be open discussions and then when you're coming for your chat with your your line manager six or seven people would have wrote, wrote, written about what they think you're working like. So it's not just that one person who's in charge of your whether you grow or not. Because often we've worked for people that yes. just don't like us. A person is holding you back. Holding yeah. you back. And so I get reviewed the same. And it really, I didn't sleep for one night after I read them. Like, and it was just really upset me because I thought I was just being so fabulous. <laughs> and... Uh, <laughs> Someone wrote, Mary only speaks to the people that inspire her. And I was like, that is so very true. <laughs> <laughs> it's really true. And I was like, oh, my God, who wrote it? Who wrote that? And it was so true. And so, you know, I, I had to think about that because the people who were maybe quiet or just weren't, and just a little bit inhibited, I was sort of maybe passing by, and, the, and it, I just had to really work on it. So you don't get away with it. So then you're unable to come in and be this hierarchical power that stops things happening because you aren't it's about everybody i'm going to get you to read your values in a sec but mm. i wanted to briefly touch on failure because what you're talking about there is is hearing uncomfortable things and yeah. acknowledging uncomfortable truths um you discuss in the book a very painful perceived failure um, when the government role as the retail troubleshooter became bogged down in arguments and party mm. politics and insufficient mm. funding, and it led to you feeling like a failure. But what struck me is how you owned it instead of attempting to conceal it. Mm. Is owning failure critical to how you at Porter's agency work now? Completely. I, you know, I mean, if everyone was a failure, I'm not sure we'd have an agency. But, and there is a big but, we all fail. And we all do stuff that's just not good enough. And we all do stuff that we just think, I didn't do the best on that. And we all don't win pieces of business. Or we have meetings with clients where they say, I don't like that. That doesn't feel good. And it's part of who we are. It's absolutely part of who we are. And on the, when I was doing the government report, what I forgot was it was politics. So you just had these pieces being written for, about you in the Daily Mail, and uh, I, I just remember waking up one Sunday, and there's just this headline in the mail said, Mary, Queen of Flops, and you went, oh my God, this is just me they're talking about and writing about, and it was just completely, it, you felt like you'd been filleted. The, the, the original, the initial instinct, fight them, right, let's sure. go, you know, my agent's long gone, right, okay, let's get a pressure release out, and then you go, 
Um, that isn't true. That is someone's opinion. That is someone who's writing about me and a lot of millions of people are going to read it. But if I fight that negative energy, I am just going to fuel this more. I know me. I know what I've done. And I'm just going to continue doing what I believe to be right. I'm not sure I'd have been able to do that 15 years ago, but I was. And I got out my little handbook by my favourite Buddhist nun called Pema Chodron, and I just read and try and connect myself back to what are the decent values in life. And I remember having a phone call from another journalist on one of those papers, you know, that just went mad trying to get stories. Oh, we've been to this town and someone spent on a pepper Pig blow-up doll. <laughs> right. uh, and that was £300. What a waste of money! <laughs> and you're like, oh, Christ. And I just remember sitting there and I said, there was, and I felt really young. It was a young guy and I said, how old are you? And he said, why? And I said, no, I just want to know how old you are. He said, I'm 24. And I said, do you really like writing and ringing me about this? And he went, not particularly Mary, but it's a story. And I went, yeah, but do you really want to write like this? Does this make you feel good? And we had this real kind of spiritual encounter over the phone <laughs> with the journal from the Daily Mail. And he wrote the story, but he wrote it kind of nicely. And I thought, I've actually changed someone's head on the Daily Mail. I don't know what the editor thought. I mean, it was about that big. They probably thought, oh, we'll just put it in that little corner. But I just, I felt that actually connecting and, and calling out that sort of behaviour and saying, that's affecting me. Oh, absolutely. That's affecting me. You might think I'm some, you know, know all, whatever, but that's affecting me. Made me vulnerable, made me honest, made me talk about failure and made a better result. And we need to do that. And I am 20 times better when anybody in the business goes, I'm fucked up. Yes, absolutely. You know, I, oh, sorry, my son's sitting there. Um, <laughs> I've said it's, wankers, it's fine. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, and it's just so much better because we all do. And if you create a space where people can do that, everybody pulls around to help and support. But, but at this point that you're talking about, it was at the height of your success, but I think it's fair to say the wheels kind of fell off emotionally, didn't they, for yeah. you? You, you yeah. know, it was, it was an odd time. You'd found a TV project with Gordon Ramsay hellish. I literally cannot imagine how. Um, <laughs> but, I mean, he's the perfect example of that alpha male yeah. culture. You felt really unsatisfied by how your very successful agency was being run by you. And so you kept a notebook. I did. And you wrote down what was important to you, what were you good at, what were you not good at, and what your values were. And it'd be great if you could share your values because they then moulded the relaunch of your agency. Yeah, they did. I, I, this is a sort of culmination of a time where I was just doing lots of TV, the business was great, I had a fashion label, I was doing much. And um, you, what happens in life, um, you go on a roller coaster, you kind of go on an escalator, and sometimes you're not sure you want to get off the next floor, and you think, why am I on this escalator? Because I've got to keep going this way up. And sometimes people put you on that, and sometimes your ego puts you on it. Um, and I was doing this show um, with Gordon Ramsay, and we had to compete against each other, and it was just the worst thing I could have ever possibly done. Um, it was a, a hotel, and he had to run all the kitchens, and... His and I was running all the hotel, and we had to get marks from people on who was the best, serve, whether it was my service or whether it was his. And he's incredibly alpha. And I think the, 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 the channel thought, how fabulous, she's alpha too, let's go. Um, and at the time, my little baby son had just been born, and, and I was filming this and going home, and each night it was live on telly, and every night I came in, Mel would just look at me like, tragic, why are you doing <laughs> Uh, why are you doing this? And Had you crossed your intuition to do it? Had you felt instinctively it wasn't you? Um, no, I hadn't. I, this is how unevolved I still was. I hadn't because I just thought this is a major, it was a major show, Mega, huge amounts yeah. of money. The, of course I would be the person that they put into that, of course. Yeah. And then I was just like, this is hell on earth. And at the time, you know, Horatio was born. My elder, Horatio had just come into the world. My eldest son was just going out into the world to university and I was everything just kind of started to be questioned about values. So I kept on this little notepad. It took me a year to make the change, but I, I wrote down all the things that I, I felt strongly about, that I loved, and all the things that I, I didn't love. And I, I thought about these kind of values that, that really made me feel strong. Was it about 
being alpha and being aggressive and having a voice that was louder than, or was it more than that? And I wrote, courage, not bravery. Courage, bravery is rooted in the physical and courage is derived from core, the Latin word for heart. And I, I like to feel courageous, but don't be ridiculously brave. Brave is sometimes just, um, well, we know if you're being brave, there's a huge amount of risk. Collaboration. Um, I love collaborating, working with other people, and I just don't feel I can be successful unless I'm surrounded and supported by great people. Um, vision over ambition. The first is Michelle Obama, the second is Lady Macbeth. <laughs> um, you know, writing down and realising the differences and where I'd fallen into these different strengths, uh, I felt was important to me that it was grounded in perseverance and emotional op uh, openness and not dominance and power. And I felt dominance and power was something that I, in my life, felt I had to have ever since my parents died and that I felt that I could control my life. Um, and that I went for excellence um, I went for, sorry, perfection. I kept on chasing perfection, not excellence. And, you know, excellence is a goal, but perfection is just a bloody straitjacket. You know? mm. So I wrote all those down. And um, that one of the, and I, as I wrote these down, I started to create, then how will that make, make you work? And um, I, caring was one of them, giving something back to those around me. And I found this quote, which is resilience. The reed bends in turbulent, turbulent winds and the oak stands stiff and breaks. And just being able to be flexible. And I just kept on looking at these qualities and thinking that's how I feel as a woman. And I thought, well, how do I reflect that in my work? And how do I reflect that in the people that I connect with? Because it's, you know, it's a bit like those people who are, who are yogis and they're wonderful and they're spiritual. And then they go into the office, they go, right, you bastard. <laughs> you know, you know, sort of that's a bit extreme, but you know, you do meet and you think they can't change those. We should be able to bring this into all our lives. And I was lucky enough that I had a business that I could affect and say, I want to change and I want to run in a different way around these values. Um, I mean, you know, it sort of shocked a lot of people who were on the board because I thought if, if we didn't have businesses that wanted to work with us in that way, then we would walk away from them. I felt kind of like, yay, you know, let's do this. But, but we were able to shift and change our business to be all around these values um, and putting at the heart of it kindness and someone said to me I was it was Janet Straight Porter <laughs> I had to do Liz Women I did have to do Liz Women um, and, and she said what about your deadline when I was in the papers you've got a deadline you've got to get it out you've got to sort it and I said well we're not all sitting around doing kumbaya and chanting at work <laughs> but kindness kindness is different from being nice kindness yeah. is very different and you can do, I can sack someone and be kind truthfully and say this isn't working but you can do it with kind people can leave with respect a dignity at the heart of what they are. Because we've all been in work where it hasn't worked, it hasn't worked for, it, work is about a relationship between many parts. So you can't just say you're crap. There's places we fit into, there's places we excel, and there's places we find. So kindness can be done. And do you know what kindness is just really about being decent human beings and to going for the right outcome. But you never hear about it talked in business. You just don't. You made dramatic decisions after that sort of light bulb moment that you had. Over the course of a year, you yeah, were working yeah, yeah. on this sort of manifesto. You made huge changes. You signed up to be profit neutral for the first year when you were making these kind of seismic shifts. There are people here who don't have their own business, who are not in a position of power where they can make those kind of huge decisions. What can people lower down the pecking order do to change in some way their culture of working? Well, you know, there's, there's two ways that we can approach this. Part of it I'd approach when I'm trying to put this into the hands of businesses who will look at this and go, this is going to be better for us as businesses to do this. And interestingly, there are some of the big businesses that are making change around this. So I think we are seeing real shifts that are happening um, because people are just going to be called out. Businesses are going to be called out if they don't. But what I always say to particularly young women and young men going into businesses now, start asking questions first of all about the business that you do go into. Asking them, what is flexibility like? How many women do you have on the board? What's the retention like? Do people stay with you? 
What is the other stuff you do about, within the business that's more than just about the outcomes? So most of us are grateful if we get offered a job and think that we right. have to work around the codes and what's come from that business. I often, we often employ people who start asking more of us as an agency. Young women, I say, use your voice. It is the most important thing you do. I spoke to a school yesterday of young women um, and they put out the microphone, they had questions, they all had their names and one couldn't even ask the question. She just sort of shrunk. And I said, this is really important. Even if you don't feel confident, you have to use your voice. Um, and it's time to say when things aren't okay. Now, you don't have to do this on your own. I've, I've done uh, different year groups with the other 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s that I've talked about in, in how we can make change happen. The only way you can make change happen is the power of us coming together. So I say find your tribe. If you are unhappy with things that are happening in work, find other women or men who also agree with you and start to influence by pushing upwards and just saying, can we talk about this? Can we talk about this? It's affecting the way we work and we think it could be better and we've got some ideas in order to do that. So it's just not accepting the status quo. And really each day thinking about yourself when you get ready to go to work, am I really truly being true to me? And are there instances that happen throughout the day which shift me and move me away from that? And am I calling it out? Because the only way that you can make change that happen is calling out. I can't do that for young women, but I'm saying to you, do it, because it's the only way that it will change. And what will happen is we're seeing this whole new shift of great new businesses changing the way we work, and you will eventually push out the old legacy businesses that are built on linear power, and we will shift it, but we can only do it by all coming together. There you go, use your voice. I hope you'll use your voices in just a couple of minutes when we go to questions, but I just wanted to ask you very finally before we move over. Um, latterly in your career, one of the things that seems to have turned you on, I suppose, the most that comes through in the book is this notion of giving back. Your charity shop project seemed to turn you on as the person, it seemed to do something to you. As time goes on, how much a part of your career and professional happiness is derived from giving? I think, you know, you can give in so many ways. I mean, I think I, I, it, it doesn't mean you can't make money by giving. Yeah. You know, we all want to have a, a living. It's how you do it. Um, so my charity shops, I, well, I, I did Mary Queen of Shops, you know, and, and most of my shops, when I finished doing them, um, you, you, I left and didn't contact again because it's so emotional. You go in and you've got a month, really, to work with a failing business. And it's a very vulnerable time for people to actually write on into a TV company and say, come and film me, I'm not making money. I'm pretty shit. That's tough. Yeah. That is really tough. So you have to go in and always, my, my, my business was about changing the people. It was never about what the outcome was. It was never about, oh, you need five more frocks over there and let's put a nice bit of paint on the wall. If you change them to believe they can change, that all comes and the profit comes from that. So that, that was always the most central. When I did Mary Queen of Charity Shops, I turned up um, and there were just these, the average age of the shop, I think, was 82, the women that were in it. There was this incredible sense of duty and giving back that I had lost. That was my parents' and grandparents' generation where you gave something back. And I'd felt my generation, certainly the generation who made money in the 80s and 90s. Yeah. What were we doing? But they also had this, they didn't give a monkeys about me at all. <laughs> I turn <laughs> up and I go, and there was these two old birds called the Toy Twins, and they'd get, people would dump toys outside the shop, and they'd come in, they'd get their little stay, their little gun out and put the price on it, and there'd be a doll with no head, they'd put 20p <laughs> on, and i say, it's got no head, they go, nevertheless, someone's given it, dear. <laughs> and that's kind, and you're like, God, this is just terrible. And I'd say, could someone dress the window? And so we'd go, dress it yourself, they didn't care. <laughs> And I just had the best time because it was just, they were there not to be on camera, they were there 
because they had a sense of giving back. And I left, and I remember the last day we opened the shop up and they were all lined up in their little snow boots. It was a terrible <laughs> winter. Brenda, the toy twins, they came on the bus, you know. Even we said, well, send the car. And I'll get the bus at 11.05. I'll be there at 11.22. And then I hand over with Mavis. She's, and I just literally thought, I can't leave them. I can't leave this. There's something so good about this. Yeah. This is the new sustainability no no novel. Yes. This is the new upcycling. This is what charity shops could be. And wow, we could make some serious money. So I went to save the children and said, we are stuck with me. I'll do this on other stores. And we've opened up 27 Mary's Living and Giving shops now and raised 15 million Amazing. for Save the Children, which has been... <laughs> yeah. And what's happened on the back of that is young people are coming into this and absolutely, I think the, the next generation is having this real sense of giving back and looking at the world and thinking about what's my part to it. But I think it doesn't always have to be thus. You, whatever you do, if you think this in any relationship, whatever it is, how is this equal and how are we both yes. benefiting from yes, this? Yes, because it's not an entirely selfless act. It makes you feel good. It yep. makes you feel fantastic. Yeah. So we're going to go to questions now. There are some roving mics. If you raise your hand as a roving, roving mic comes to you, I'll ask the first question um, from our British Library entrepreneur in residence, Julie <laughs> Dean. So if somebody raises their hand while that's happening, I'll go to the first question. Do raise your hand if you want to ask Mary anything. Uh, whatsoever. Oh, there's this lady here. He's sitting down okay. having a coffee. What are you doing? <laughs> so, uh, do you, our entrepreneur in residence is Julie Dean, the founder of the Cambridge Satchel Company, a company I'm sure you're familiar with. Yes. Um, Julie has submitted a question that she'd love your thoughts on. It's very businessy. Mm. Should businesses concentrate on growing themselves in their home market before casting their eyes overseas? This is quite pertinent to the Cambridge Satchel Company because um, this is where things yeah. went wonky for a little bit. Yeah, I mean, the Cambridge Satchel got a well, great, great uh, um, yeah. business. But I think, um, yes, because I think especially something where it's culturally connected to that time. So something like the Cambridge Satchel Company, you're selling something that's really connected to a British culture and a way of life. So, and I've seen this with many businesses that have launched and done well in their own country and then gone globally, lost the local market, but because they're making money in, say, Japan, they keep feeding that market and then slowly but surely it erodes the brand and its power. So I think you really have to... And likewise, I've seen many brands go internationally and haven't really connected culturally with that local market, thinking they can just spread a brand out and that you don't need to understand the nuances. And there are many nuances on brands and why they connect emotionally with people across the country, so across the world rather. So yes, I think it's vitally important, especially in a country like the UK, which has huge credibility when it comes to brands. I would be pushing that as much as you possibly can. It's interesting, you're talking about identity again, aren't yes. you? You're talking about the identity yes. of a brand yeah. um, as you were talking about personal identity. Okay, over to you. Okay, um, I was surprised to read in a women's magazine recently about imposter syndrome, that we're still talking about that. And I've been working for about 40 years and I've been, been fairly successful and had a new boss recently, a new male boss, and he actually made me feel like after 40 years I'd been rumbled until I talked myself out of that. So I just wondered, do you still feel that we're sort of experiencing that and that women feel that they're still... They've still got imposter syndrome or that we're somewhere where we don't deserve to be. I, I was just surprised to read about it recently that it's still a thing, even. It's a huge thing, I think. Do you ever suffer yeah. from imposter syndrome? I don't. I don't. I, I think I am particularly <laughs> unusual. I mean, my wife always says to me, oh, for God's sake. Um, you might, and I, well, I don't, but I, and I think in, it's very different for me. I am in a position where I, you know, I, my, with my agency, my, my own profile, I'm able to manage that. It, it's imposter syndrome. That person made you feel that you weren't great. Um, I just think that's shit management. And um, that can happen anywhere. I, I, I've had that. I will have it in situations where you, you feel uncomfortable, someone else is taking the power and, and just taking it away from you. And it can be done implicitly, it can be done subtly, 
it can be done completely not subtly. So I, I think men suffer with it too, if I'm honest. I think what that just is, that is just not good management and that is someone who is not getting the best from you. And I've seen that in many businesses. I've seen incredible clients that we've worked with have to leave business. And you think, what's happened there? They were great. Someone, one, someone has made them feel that way. That's why I try and spread. We don't have one person in control because that is a terrible way to end someone's career or their, their belief in themselves. I, I think it is um, particularly... I've read actors talking about it as well, but I don't think it's particularly just for women. I don't. But I think maybe women talk more about it because they're easier to feel that I'm feeling vulnerable rather than men maybe talking about it. Thank you. The good thing was it I worked through it. I, did. Huh? <laughs> I worked through it. So I didn't well, I think there was, a, there was a, a, a thing that I did in the um, Sunday Times. They do this back page in Sunday Times style, and, and I answered a question. Is he going? Oh, bye, darling. <laughs> um, bye, bye. Um, and I answered a question on... Uh, it was a woman who was just, just... It's that subtle bullying of an email not including them. Yes. When they're working on something. Just edging out. Just that edging out. And it's very difficult to say or just inviting them into, not into a meeting, or it's just having a subtle conversation with someone else and they've been alienated. The thing is, you have to call it out. Because the minute you say to someone, I'm feeling uncomfortable, it, what, you are putting that onus back onto them. Now, there's two ways that that can be dealt with. I'm feeling really uncomfortable. I, you know, I've been doing really well. I don't know why, but I'm feeling uncomfortable because of this, this, this. They then have to come back at you. Now, he can go, oh, I, don't, I didn't think that. You know, I didn't think that about you. I mean, I think you're great. Fine, and show me, you know. Or they do have to do something about it. Oh, I didn't know I was doing that. I'm sorry, I do think you're good. Or third, yeah, I don't think you're that great. Then work it through with me properly. But I think unless you call it out, unless you pick it up, a lot of that, a lot, a lot, a lot of that goes on very common I think to yeah. be blocked by a person who yeah. you think doesn't like you or doesn't yeah. appreciate you so you've taken that structure away you just move that away but you can if the structure is still on a one-to-one -one, you have to go in because it's just so stressful hello just up here <laughs> coming <laughs> hold the line please call us <laughs> thank you very much um, Mary, you um, talked about banks and um, the paternity leave that they're giving, very innovative, and I think with regards, there's a lot of good work about mm. women going back to work. I work in finance, and mm. the thing is that there's a massive problem on the other side, which is women don't make 80% of purchase decisions when it comes to finance. Do you think in empowering more women in, in finance and working in finance and that empathy and that EQ... Do you think that will help women actually feel more engaged with things like that? And because most people tell me it's just boring, but actually we all know it's really, really important. You know, you talked about money being important. It's not everything, but it is important. So do you think we can change some of that? Because it's so different in finance. Are you talking about women going into work in finance or taking the responsibility for finance within their family or within taking their Taking responsibility for finance. So, so buying um, financial products. Financial products, yeah. Okay. I mean, you know, it's going to sound... I'm, everyone's going to groan if I start talking about it, but things like you know, pensions oh. and all that. I know, but <laughs> yeah. it's important. And you're talking about empowering people. No, it is people. important because what you're saying is, and I, I do listen to you on that, because I actually mention this in the book, that women can be as bad uh, in situations like this where they sort of let the man yes. pick that up. Mm. Oh, I don't want to deal with that. You know, are, are, are they split the roles and those really important things are invariably being looked after mm. by men. So I think that is important. I think how you get more women into finance is look at the ways that some of the Jaguar Land Rover did, which was brilliant. They realised that not many young women were coming into work in engineering or into the car industry. And that also, men who were in the car industry, they stayed in it because it was just such... They loved working within the car industry. So all that middle management was stuck there, all that senior management. And they looked and they thought, my God, it's going to be a lifetime before we shift this. So they just made a conscious decision to bring 50% 
of the employees that they were going to bring in right at the beginning were going to be women. And they've done a phenomenal shift in that. So I do think it's vitally important that you do empower. Listen, we talk about power. One of the things that I realised is unless we get into positions of power, and let's face it, money is power, finance is power, unless we do, we have very little influence on what happens, as Sally said, to our National Health Service, to our schools. If we leave that, the same with politics, unless those cultures are shifted to bring women in, we are not sitting in the places of power. We only have to go back in history to the church that just screwed it all for us lot. No, it is. Look yeah. at the... That's where power... Oh, my God, someone cut me off. <laughs> <laughs> God, it was God. <laughs> Did you? <laughs> Sorry, it's the Catholic upbringing. Oh, Jesus Christ, that I rejected very early on, let me tell you. But they, that happened. Women were suppressed by the church. We, you know, that, that energy in the world has just been pushed aside. And, you know, that was where power was held. Not as much today, but we have technology of politics. And when I there was one was one part in the book when I went into the, um, to uh, Downing Street and um, with Jeanette Winston, we were moaning on about something together. And I thought, well, we'll go in the pair of us and we're like bashing heads. And it was the call for a vote, and it was it was all these MPs were running through the corridors. And I said to Jeanette, let's just count how many women. And there was 19 women, and I think we got to like 200. And all. we were bored by the time there's so many men. And really, the reason why women aren't in there is because of the toxic culture, the fact that it was 7.30 at night, they wouldn't be doing the vote, they needed to be home. So you need to look at those businesses, we need to look at the structures of them and say, what will bring women in? And we need to educate women who just say, let's hand that over to the men. But I wonder if it's a chicken and egg in that if women don't ever see women dealing in finance but on the other side of the desk, you think it's a man's world. I just bought a new car from a woman and I've, I visited various showrooms and the one where the woman tried to sell me the car is the one I went with because it just felt more relevant. If, and so if all the people selling financial products are men, then I guess women would think it was a man's domain. Yeah, completely. Yeah, you kind of need to see it back at you don't you lady up there yeah oh he's having his cup of tea again he loves it <laughs> sits down he goes oh, um, and one. then after that this lady in the orange here hello hello hi um positive discrimination and quotas um you've been touching upon this my daughter's sitting beside me she's doing mechanical engineering um but people say oh well, you only got into mechanical engineering because you're a woman and they they help you know help the women. My son's trying to do, he's trying to do maths and um, computer science and that side of things, and he couldn't get into um, the, the um, courses and things that they were offering because they were female only. So it, it, it's quite hard when you're offering the quotas and doing that without skewing things and not operating on a sort of meritocracy. I, look, listen, I'm with you on this, and that's why I don't think it is about quotas. I think it's about changing, and I go back again, the culture and the structure of that, because that positive discrimination... You know, this, this has been done purely because we are in a real state here, that there are so few women. And I don't think we've properly looked at what the issues are. This has to start right from grassroots, from children understanding what they can be and where they can be. We wouldn't then get into state, stages of positive discrimination. Um, I, I'd love to say it's not needed. It kind of is to get us through, to get some shift changing. I guess that's what happened with, you know, uh, uh, Land Rover. They had to say, do you know what 50% we're going to have to make females? Uh, to get through, but I think it is tough on young men. I think it is, but hopefully, hopefully what they will start to see is that this has been ridiculously tough on women for far too long. Uh, but, but I answer the question on that is, let's change the way we work. Let's change the culture of work so that we don't have to do quotas and positive discrimination. Yeah, I don't think it does. The women go down. Either. You don't what? I don't think it helps the women either. 
in, a, in many senses because it undermines what they're trying to achieve. Yeah, they think they don't. They haven't properly achieved that. They've been yeah, they've been put forward. And of course, none of it does. But we've got a big bloody job on our hands. Yeah, it's difficult, isn't it, in the workplace because we all think well, the best person for the job should get yeah. the job. But what makes the best person for the job? Experience, qualifications. Well, if that experience is largely given to men, how will women ever? It's not a level playing field, so we can only have a meritocracy if it's all equal from the start, right? Which, as you say, it yeah. isn't. Yeah. Lady in the orange, and then we'll come to you. Hi, good evening. Um, I work in construction and manufacturing, and I have a predominantly... Um, I'm, it's a family business, and we have a predominantly male workforce. And... Emotion in the workplace, um, it's my family business, but because it's been uh, run by a man, my father, for many, many years, showing emotion in the workplace has been a very sort of stiff upper lip, oh, that shouldn't happen. And um, I was very, very interested in the culture, sort of the values that you were talking about, and I'd very much like to be able to change the culture. And I'm making small inroads, but I'd just like some <coughs> advice or some recommendations about how you would look at bringing more emotion into the workplace? Well, I, I, it is in the book. By the book. No, it is in the book. Um, <laughs> but it's interesting because one of the examples that I put in the book was a, 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 an oil rig where... then you can show this to your father. Um, and bless him, you know, he's done it the way that he's known, you know? So um, th this oil rig work, as I can't find the example and what page it is. Sad, that bit. It was wonderful. And basically, I, I looked at real male institutions where they made change happen like that as well. <laughs> and, the, you know, the, the, they, they... It was all around safety. I can't remember absolutely the details of the... Of the but the, the whole oil rigs was about the most macho. And they were really having, you know, serious issues that were having over safety. So they switched the emphasis on it being around macho and put these codes into place that were based around safety and put um, these female sort of caring for your colleagues rather than you being seen as the most brave. And it shifted the whole... And they whole... stopped punishing for false alarms, didn't yeah, they? they? That stopped, was the other key. Yeah, exactly. If there was a false alarm, they punished, but they stopped all that and actually made them more honest and open about the way that they worked. And it had an incredible response on it. So there are lots of... There's one of my favourites was the, the, the male uh, Swedish male football team. Um, which I, and they, these, they, wouldn't, they weren't particularly a great football team. They were all made up of people that didn't quite make it into the Premier League or the top leagues or whatever. And all the blokes would turn up when they wanted and, you know, they were slightly sort of despondent. And the, the, the manager said, I'm not doing it anymore. Stuffed a lot of you. Um, and then one night he got a knock at the door and this guy said, I've had to go back on the building site. It's killing me. <laughs> Could you start up the team again? And they pulled together another few and he said, all right, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to make you... It's not just about winning the game. It's not just about aggression. I'm going to make you do different things. So he made them all put on a performance of Swan Lake. <laughs> he gave them all these different novels to read that were just, you know, some really, I think, Anna Karenina, culturally opened them, took them to art galleries. I kid you not, they beat Arsenal. <laughs> it was wonderful. Now... Not, not this English team now we've got, because I think what's-his-name did a great job. I was so proud of them in, in, in England. Southgate. But, yeah, Southgate with his little waistcoat on. Swan Love him. I, I, I think he was really understood, you know, how to, to get these guys. But look back at our English team, England team, when it was full of the Beckhams and the Roonies and these individual egos that went out. <coughs> and I read a thing in the Times when uh, this guy reported on this, and I thought, this is so interesting. And this sports writer remembers them going out to um, South Africa. And I think it was one of the leaders in South Africa was enabled a meeting with Mandela and got them all this meeting to meet the English team because Mandela loved his, his rugby and his football. Only half of them turned up to meet Mandela. Oh, that's a shocker. Yeah. Well, it's about winning, isn't it? So there's lots of examples within there that can show this. And I think you do it with an openness with your father and just trying things. That's what it's about, it's trying. I'm, I'm not even completely... We make cock-ups still in business, but it's about just looking and trying and creating things that just make people feel that they can be who they truly want to be 
and that will get the best out of them. They don't have to be these macho. Half of them will love you for it in the end. It's very true, actually. Gareth Southgate does embody the philosophy in this book. He that's so that's does. I, I'd point. love to meet him on it. I thought he's done an he's extraordinary job. I was so proud of the, the England team totally. for the first time in I don't know how long. So we have life. Um, a couple of questions from social media. Nottingham. I asked you, um, do you think that women will wait whilst organisation organisations catch up, or will more women create their own tribes and their own businesses, start more businesses? Oh, it's the biggest thing. Uh, women are starting up businesses. The business group is now uh, women entrepreneurs. I think it's grown hugely and women and very of colour fast. too and women yeah. women, women of colour even more. Yeah. The minority groups are saying, I can't get in there, can't break the codes sod it, I'll do my own thing. So it is a massive growing thing. But, you know, here's the thing. What I love is when we look at the amount of businesses, everybody thinks, oh, my business won't change. There are something, I don't know the stat, but the majority of businesses in this country are small, medium-sized businesses that can make that change happen. So women are out there just doing their own things. And I think with the internet and digital world, they're able to do that. So I think we're going to see this happen so much quicker. Do you have another one from Sophie? Uh, yes. Oh, oh. oh she's I'm, got one I'm up coming there, to Len. you. Do you want to go first? No, no it's yeah, go on, I stand up and use your voice. <laughs> I'll, um, let's do you and come back to social media. Be okay. with you. Go ahead. Do you have the mic? Okay, there you go. I didn't know if it had made it to you yet. Oh, are you going to shout at me? No. Um, yeah, I wanted to ask you about women and taking risks in business because um, I've kind of after working in criminal justice for many years and then becoming an author, uh, and now got my own little tiny, weeny little business, um, there are financial risks that have to be taken all the time in terms of um, publicity and marketing and putting money into it, which I often haven't got, but it's worth it because of the returns. And I find that maybe it's a generational thing, I don't know, maybe it's all women of all ages, that women have much more difficulty taking risks than men do. I'm not sure, I don't know the answer to that. I, I don't know, I think, I, th I thought you were going to say that m m banks lending money are much more risk averse when it comes to women and there are stats on that that is quite true. And I just was on the conference with Telegraph Women in Business where they were finding out lots of startups and entrepreneurs were just not getting the funding that was So required. men are more likely to secure a loan and yeah. find out, oh, interesting. Yeah, I don't know, I, I, I mean, I've seen lots of women take risks in business. I think, you know, the thing is, it's all about a calculated risk, isn't it? It's about thinking, do I believe in what I've got to sell here? Yes, I do. Do I believe I'm a great writer? Do I believe I'm going to get the sales on this? Yes, I do. Therefore, those risks need to be taken. And um, I think, you know, women invariably are, are maybe more balanced in their risk. It's what, what I talk about is courage rather than bravery. You know, the, the two are quite different. What, when you say risk, is it a risk that, you know, is it goes into a danger zone or is it a good positive risk where you know the outcome, you give yourself a time that if I don't get the, the returns on this, then I pull out. I don't know. I've seen I've seen a lot of women take a lot of risk in business. I think it's quite I've, I think it, it's quite equal. Um, I, I don't know what else to say on that one, really. Let's have another from social media, then we can probably squeeze one more in if you want to raise your hand. Go ahead. OK, so the question I'll um, put forward is from a company called the Real Junk Food Project, who are watching up in um, Glasgow Library tonight. And um, they've asked, how do you switch off from work as they're struggling to find that balance themselves right now? Well, this there's a bottle a of wine in there, you. isn't yeah. there? So, yeah. <laughs> oh, God. I, 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 well, I, I, I try not to think about work at the weekends. I mean, look, come on, I'm a bit older now, but I don't work at the weekend. We have an agreement that nobody emails over the weekend to each other throughout the business, unless it's something positive that you want to say. I think there's nothing worse 
than looking, you know, and getting. You say, oh, it's okay, I'm on holiday. You can let me know, you can let me know. I, I, the, you, the last thing that you want is to see anything negative or worrying. That just yeah. pulls your energy down and drains you. So I have a very clear rule that we don't do that. I think, um, I mean, look, I walk into my house and it's like Paddy's Market with kids. So I, I mean, I easily turn off. That certainly put, brings you right back down to earth. You have to deal with that and you have to be very <coughs> present in doing that. And also, I, I like rest. I mean, it's nothing to, you know, I like, I need rest. I need it to be good. And I know that I need that. And I'm not very good on four hours sleep and mm. working like It just doesn't make me best. So I make sure that I put rest into my day and I make sure I put care for myself, whether that's just a walk or even sometimes at the agency, I just walk around the block and down Lamb's Conduit Street and just look into the shop windows or ch chat to people and move myself outside that headspace. Those are really small. And I meditate um, and I try, and even, you know, when I'm going very busy and work, I have motorbikes that drive me around when I'm filming. And uh, it's just the most wonderful meditative thing. I just sit on the bike and the guy goes, do you want to talk or not, Mary? I go, no, I don't want to talk. And that, that 20 minutes from wherever I'm going from is my time just to completely connect and rest. And, um, and I also make sure mischief and funs in my day where I have a laugh and, I, and, and so that my team uh, always do the same. We, we laugh. And I think laughter just really feeds the soul and, and rests you and takes you outside this. My God, let's just not be so bloody serious. <laughs> like, ser life is just so serious sometimes. And you can make money and have a laugh. <laughs> well, before we have mischief and fun in the bar, there is one last question at the back of the hall. Hi, a mic is coming your way. Thank you for your patience. I could hardly see you at the back there, I'm sorry. Um, firstly, thank you very much. It's been really motivating and inspiring, so thank you. Um, in the spirit of using my voice, I just wanted to sort of challenge a little bit on the point about um, calling things out because I watched the recent coverage about Sir Philip Green with interest and there was this sense in the coverage that there was kind of a criticism of people that knew it was bad and let it go and didn't say anything and didn't raise it and there was almost, yeah, kind of negativity about that whereas the reality is even if you're in a workplace and you're following people like yourselves and reading your books and you know how you want things to be the truth is it's really difficult to call it out if you're trying to keep your job so that you can pay the nanny um and i just wondered recognizing that that is the truth of it like what else could we be doing like have you got any other tips for what we could be doing to try and make the working world better if actually, for whatever reason, we don't feel like we can walk into our boss or our boss's boss and say, this isn't an acceptable way to uh, operate. Look, it's the most difficult thing. Of course it is. Imagine going into Philip Green and saying, you're a knob, mate, <laughs> calling it out. Quite. <laughs> you know, well, we, uh, you know it's, it's, but you, there's lots of questions that we have to ask ourselves. And um, you're right, there's that fear. That's the fear. And they know that fear. They know the fear. And we, we've all been in I've had it completely done to me. And I thought, yeah. I genuinely will not be able to afford the mortgage. Well, of course I've had it done. But I think that we, the more we are able to connect with our peer groups and our tribes and say, how do we get together? Now, I think in the, in, I mean, uh, the Philip Green story, um, I would have gone into the human resources department and spoken to them on that and just said this is really affecting the team and if they are refusing to do something about it there comes a time when you say is this good for me is this making me feel good am I able to be the best that I am and is this making me happy and I would have been looking for jobs elsewhere to move outside that if you felt that you couldn't have talked about it or opened up the debate on it the more we keep it in of course it's bloody difficult but that's where their power is that is where their power is and the more we keep quiet about this the worse it will get and here's the thing that being called out by someone blowing a whistle on it by Jane Shepherdson talking opening yeah. saying yeah I, I bloody saw that shit the more that is called out, the more it will open the doors for you guys and the more fear will be in those corporations 
And that's the only way we're going to make it happen. And always demand an exit interview, I would think, if you are leaving, to make sure that you have your exit interview and get it done. Absolutely. And the other thing is, is going for another job, tell the truth. Just say, I left. Don't try and cover it. I left because the culture and I felt this. You know, I, I tell the truth on that so that you are and you will get other work. But there is that fear of the unknown and that's what keeps them all in those positions of absolutely hierarchical bullying power. Thanks for your questions. Thanks for all your questions. Uh, Mary will be doing a signing in the foyer. There's also a bar, more importantly. In the <laughs> um, but in the meantime, thank you so much for coming to the British Library and thank you to Mary Porter. Thank you.